From New America and Slate, I'm Bridget Schulte, and this is Better Life Lab. There's almost a kind of weird, sadistic or masochistic pride, I think, that some people take in being like, oh, well, I work way more than 40 hours. You know, that's Mm -hmm. the bare minimum. And what is that? You know, why, why do we have that kind of culture? It gets more intense every year. The drive to work longer and longer and longer hours. And there's striking new research that shows that women, who already get paid less than men, are put at a distinct disadvantage by America's growing culture of overwork. We'll hear more about that research in a few minutes. For most of this episode, though, I want you to hear the personal story of a woman who for almost two decades pretty much beat the odds of the American workplace. She's smart, funny, driven. She worked for years toward her dream job, and she got it. But then something happened to change her entire relationship to work. Her story is inspiring and maybe just a little bit heartbreaking. Her name is Keenet Howitt, although I had to ask her how to pronounce it since it's spelled C-I-A-N-N-A-T. It's an Irish name. And I spoke with Keenet from her office at Emory University in Atlanta. I started my career as an environmental lawyer, and really that was always my dream. And I think that the challenges of work-life balance are particularly acute when you have a passion. When you're working in sort of a mission-driven way, Mm. it's harder sometimes, or at least it was hard for me, to always have those boundaries. So very early on, I... Gave a lot of myself to my work. I was an environmental lawyer in a law firm. And that culture is one in which you're billing every six minutes of your time. And obviously, all your time can't be billed. Um, So you're really having to work a big number of hours just to hit, you know, that 60 hours of billable time. You know, during those days, I would go to the grocery store on the weekend, and I would bring my groceries for the week to the office and put them in the refrigerator because I knew (laughs) breakfast, lunch, and dinner would be at the office, at the firm. And, you know, it's funny because I look back on that, and it's not as though I was unhappy. I really wasn't. Mm -hmm. I was doing what I wanted to do. I felt grateful to have a job. I was young and had lots of energy, and I was learning. And That was also what everybody else was doing. So you know how that can be when you're in a world where the culture is simply to do that. You don't know that there's anything wrong with it. Right. Um, After four or five years of that, you know, I started to realize that the partners who I worked for, who were all men, had stay at home, not working outside the house, wives Mm. who really supported their ability to be at the office around the clock. And I didn't have anyone Mm -hmm. (laughs) at home. And that was a big difference. And so all the all the partners, all the leaders in the firm at the time were male, there weren't any women or anybody with caregiving responsibilities who had risen in that kind of environment? There were women who were partners in the firm, but I didn't work for them. They weren't in the environmental practice group. There wasn't a close mentor relationship, no. Mm -hmm. And that was, you've got to remember, this was early 90s. So there just weren't as many women in law firms and certainly not as partners. Now I think it's changed quite a lot. And I have dear friends who are partners in law firms who have two nannies and, you know, they make it work. Um, But at that time, no, it was really much more a culture of, you know, how much can we get done in the 24 hours in this day, whether that day be Christmas Eve or the day before Thanksgiving or, you know, it was very intense. I look back at those notebooks, I've kept them, and they're recorded are all those years of six minute increments. And it's. It's sort of a funny feeling. You think, wow, wow. you know, wow. <laughs> you were um, in sort of a strange working world that really was about this constant production. You know, we think about that in sort of a compassionate way when we think about people working the conveyor belts at a right. mill or something. Right. But yeah. there's a there's a way in which those law firms in those years really were a bit of a 
a mill, you know, you were a young attorney, they were interested in getting as much out of you as they could. So to put in, you know, to get the 60 hours a week, billable hours, you know, how many hours would you put in? I mean, I'd always be at the firm by 730 or eight at the latest, and I'd always stay till about 11. I didn't work Christmas or Thanksgiving, but you know, you're still, you're working a lot. And I remember (laughs) clearly being there to Christmas Eve till late in the day, you know, so I really think any attorney you talk to, at least from that period, will say that that was very much the way it was. Um, But I will say also that very much in the same way that those people who are preparing for a career in medicine work very long hours Mm -hmm. in order to get a lot of exposure to different diseases and how to respond to them, there is something about working that much and being immersed in practicing law that does help you as an early, as a young attorney early in your career, really absorb a lot of the things you have to know for the rest of your career. So I don't want to overstate it as something that was just horrible for me. If it had been horrible, I wouldn't have done it. But it served its purpose because I came out of that experience feeling as though I had been trained and was ready to take on other roles. Mm. You know, I was looking up some statistics on the American Bar Association website about women partners. Just you said that things might have changed by now. Maybe it's changed some since the early 90s, but it looks like women partners are still about 20 to 25 percent of all partners. Uh, The 200 largest law firms, the managing partners, women are about... Uh, 18% and they they're about half the associates and half the summer associates and there's still uh, there's still a pay gap there. Um right. do you think that the right. hours are part of that that men are just able to put in more hours than women or what do you think accounts for that? I think that's absolutely it Bridget. I think that the data speaks for itself in a way when you have half of graduates being women entering that workforce what is happening to them between those early years and the level you'd come to and being partner, which would be maybe five years out? Well, it, most are in their 20s or early 30s, and many want to start families. And so you're thinking about how do you um, work the kind of hours necessary to rise in the ranks. And for many people, that trade-off's just not going to be worth it. Yeah. Um, and you may have the skills that exceed those of your male counterparts, but you're having to make those challenging choices. And so, yeah, when I look at that data, I can't help but wonder Do we still have a situation where couples are finding themselves having to make the choice of one person's career over another? The culture of the working world makes a lot of couples have to say, all right, one of us is going to have to lose our dream. You know, I I think I really do think it's very poignant. And they've invested money and time and talent. And it breaks my heart, really, that they would then graduate and then not be able to do exactly what they want to do. They have to make these compromises. So, you know, we have this assumption that the only way to do law is to do it like like a maniac working 730 in the morning to 11 o'clock at night. Let me just push back a little bit. Is that really the best way to do the work? I'm so glad you asked that because I really... I didn't give you the honest answer that a lot of that was my own probably neurosis or something. I mean, I'm sure someone could diagnose it, but uh, (laughs) it was my own feeling that I needed to be there and work hard and learn as much as I could because I wanted to be really good at this, you know, and Mm -hmm. I wanted to... I had, I guess, a a level of anxiety or insecurity that if I wasn't there working as hard as I saw the people around me work, that I would slip, that I wouldn't be someone who would then be in a position to either be a partner or go out. And my dream was to run a nonprofit public interest law group, which I got to do. But I saw a lot of other people struggling with it. I think if you look and interview others who are practicing during that time, you'll hear a lot of the same stories, that there was very much an expectation of overwork. That's Kenneth Howitt. We'll continue with her story in a couple minutes. First, though, I want to put into context this culture of overwork that Kenneth is describing. 
I recently had an interesting phone call with Yungju Cha. She's a sociologist at Indiana University. Yungju and her colleagues published a study that looked at American salary data over 35 years. They compared wages paid to people who worked a full-time 40-hour week with those of so-called overworkers who spend at least 50 hours a week on the job. It turns out we're now living in a golden age of the overworker. When we are looking at how much overworkers are compensated relative to those people who don't work long hours, uh, we found that overworkers are increasingly better compensated. By 2010, uh, overworkers actually earn 6 to 8 percent more per hour compared to their full-time counterparts. You know, that's so interesting. So people who put in more than 50 hours a week, they earn 6 to 8 percent more per hour than people who work a regular full-time schedule. Uh, I remember reading research by, say, Claudia Golden and others, you know, say back in the 70s, that if you worked overtime, unless you were an hourly worker and you got time and a half, but if you were on salary and you worked long hours, that was just your gift to the company. You yeah. didn't get extra money. So is this a new thing that people who overwork uh, uh, earn more money? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Our data starts from 1979. At the beginning, overworkers actually earning fewer dollars back in the old days. Um, actually, there was a penalty for working long hours. That phenomenon actually flipped around the mid-90s. Ever since that, it's steadily increasing. Well, that also coincided with the time that more and more women were entering the workplace. And so I guess what I'm wondering is, who is able to put in these kinds of long hours? I, you know, is everybody expected to overwork and then never see their families? There's a very steady gender gap in the proportion of people who can put in long work hours. Among men, the proportion of overworkers range from 15 to 19 percent, whereas among women, it's more like 4 to 6 percent. Mm, so it is wow. a, there's a large gap. There are more men who can benefit from this trend of really striking increase in the wage premium for overwork. This actually, in turn, uh, affects the gender wage gap. You know, education gap has decreased between men and women. But this overwork phenomenon, it cancels out those equalizing factors. Mm, so, wow. in other words, if the payoff for the overwork stays constant throughout the 35 years, then during that time, we would have seen the gender wage gap decreasing by 10% more. So here's pretty compelling evidence. We already know there's a, a gender wage gap just in terms of the types of professions men and women tend to do. We also know that there's a wage gap even within professions. There's sort of this unexplained gap that um, that men tend to make more. Uh, and now you're saying that overwork uh, is also part of what, what leads to the gender wage gap. So all of that begs the question, it's like, so what do you do about it? You know, there's a problem, but it's really hard to fix because it's really deeply grounded in our the way that we define culturally how we define good workers. It's a, in some ways a deeply grounded in the American psyche. So I think that fundamentally we have to change the ways in which we define good workers. It doesn't have to be the person who will always be there and who will always be available for work. That's actually prototype of that workers is a male breadwinning workers who has a full-time housewife mm -hmm. who can take care of all other things. Right. But when you think about workforce composition, even among men, it's a very small proportion. So it, not only it hurts women, but also it hurts men as well. It's, it's bad for everybody. That's Yung Ju Cha. She's an associate professor of sociology at Indiana University. Let's get back to Keenet Howitt. After her time eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner at the environmental law firm, she landed a job as a senior attorney at the EPA in Washington, D.C. You know, it's funny because there's this sort of stereotype of the federal government bureaucrat who clocks in and clocks out. Right. And that was not my experience. In a very positive way, it was a time... Um, especially at the EPA. This was under the Clinton administration, and they had put a big emphasis on enforcement of our environmental laws, and it was such an exciting time to be a young attorney. I remember clearly going to my manager and saying, I really want to get involved in cases related to these confined animal feedlot operations, you know, and 
we really hadn't brought many of those cases at the federal level. And they were like, go for it, you know. And so I got to work a lot with lawyers in the region, bringing really important early cases related to those feeding operations, which were causing very significant water and air pollution and just public health impacts to those surrounding communities, longtime farming communities that were seeing big, huge industrial hog operations and chicken operations coming into their communities and just really lowering their quality of life. So it was very gratifying, very rewarding. But, you know, I poured myself into it. Um, And again, I think that's the rub about feeling passionate about your work. It's the most wonderful thing in life. And I always tell my nieces and nephews, and I'll tell my son when he gets old enough, you know, try to find your passion and do it. But the thing about that, too, is that you want to pour yourself in. And if there isn't a culture that is sort of telling you to also respect the parts of life that have to do with your personal health. And and I think I think about that time for me. I had no children. I was unmarried. I wasn't really dating anyone seriously, you know. And so there wasn't anybody waiting at home, you know, Um so I just didn't go home a whole lot. Uh, I would, I wasn't doing what I wanted to do. Um, but it also, I can look back on it now and it was not in balance. And that was almost my whole 30s, you know. And that's a time when a lot of people are having children and, you know, Mm-hmm. Um, settling down and um, so did did work then uh, it's sort of hard to meet someone and it's hard to have that life outside of work if all you're doing is working you weren't putting yourself in a position to find anything else right yes I think that's right and you know it also was not a big priority for me um, it wasn't as though I was sad about it it was just that I just didn't have as many opportunities. And, you know, one of the wonderful things about Washington, D.C. is there are tons of single childless women in their late 30s. I had a huge group of fantastic female friends. It's interesting coming down to Atlanta, which was my next stop, there were almost no single childless women in their late 30s, early 40s. I felt very conscious of that. And people really would kind of look at me like, oh, what's her deal? You know, really? <laughs> because, uh, um, and it would be interesting to look at data specific to Washington, D.C. along the lines of, you know, are women there rising to the top more rapidly? Because I will say there is a culture of support. I felt like I had a village of women Mm -hmm. who were in my same situation who were supporting me Hmm. in my dream. So how did you, you know, you say you have a son. How did that finally happen? Uh. (laughs) (laughs) So it was interesting. So I moved down to Atlanta. I took a role as director of the Southern Environmental Law Center. I was doing my dream. You know, I was running an office of incredibly talented, intelligent attorneys doing this incredibly important work to protect wild places, special places in the South. It was consuming and fantastic. But because there weren't as many other women in my same role, I do think I had a bit of a wake-up call. It shook me up a bit. And I can tell you the exact day that it all changed for me in terms of meeting my husband. I had had a girlfriend um, from back in my law firm days who, when I came to town, said to her husband, oh, I think, you know, I should set Keenan up with this guy who was a friend of his. And I was like, no, 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 not interested. And then it was <laughs> Valentine's Day and I was on an airplane and the flight steward said, happy Valentine's Day. And I thought, okay, I knew it was February 14th, but I had no consciousness <laughs> that it was actually Valentine's Day. So that was when I thought, you know, I need a little romance in my life, probably. (laughs) Um, So I got his number, and we met, and we're married now. And I had my baby at 43, and I was incredibly lucky. Um, Now, I make that sound like it was falling off a log. It was not. I was working at that public interest organization, you know, much in the same way I did when I was at the firm and at EPA. I was pouring myself into it, and I think more so, actually, because this was my dream come true. This was my job I wanted my whole life, you know, Mm. and 
Uh, it was so fantastic. I really cannot say enough good things about that experience. Um, but the clock is ticking. And I also really wanted to have a child. And I finally made the tough decision to leave that job. Mm. And very shortly after that, I was able to have a child. I'd had problems with losing pregnancies. I don't know that any medical person would say, oh, there's definitely a connection. But I can tell you that from my body, (laughs) um, I think it was critical that I take the stress level down a notch in order to have a child. My body knew I just needed to have more space and be better to myself physically in order to carry a pregnancy to completion. That's Keenet Howitt. I've been listening to her story here at the Better Life Lab with Dan Conley. He's a researcher with Ideas42, the behavioral innovation lab we've teamed up with, as we look at the conflict between work and life. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Dan... What do you think? She's uh, obviously dedicated and passionate. She was working uh, at her dream job, and uh, and yet it was causing so so much work, so much stress. That's obviously really hard to hear. You know, working at her dream job, she still had that same level of stress. And I think that points to a lot of research from behavioral sciences showing that intrinsic motivation can actually be even more deeply motivating than earning more money. There's a great study asking Swiss citizens whether they'd be willing to accept nuclear waste in their backyard. And some people are offered a substantial amount, and a quarter of them say, okay, you can bury the waste in, you know, in my neighborhood. And the other half, we're not offered any money at all, but we're just told, hey, this is kind of your duty as a citizen of our country. Would you be willing to, to entertain this nuclear waste in your neighborhood? And double the amount. Half of people said that would be okay just, just when they were reminded that this is a civic duty. So suffice to say, intrinsic benefits can be really rewarding, but obviously can drive people towards an amount of overwork that is exceptionally stressful. Um, you know, I'm glad to hear that she was able to have a child and, and realize that part of her dream. I do think it's unfortunate that we ask people to make those decisions. And I think part of the mission of our work is saying, how do we create a world in which people aren't forced to make really difficult decisions like that? And that's a dilemma that Keenet is keenly aware of. Let's listen to the last part of our conversation. I switched to the current role I have, which is not an easy job, but it's not taxing in the same way that those jobs were. And um, and I was able to have a little boy who's now eight. So. Oh, wow. You know, you talk about how running the nonprofit was really your dream job. I guess what I'm wondering is, could there have been another way to do it? Was it also part of the culture that just also made it impossible to do in a way that would have given your body and your <laughs> and yourself time for more time for your life or more of that sense of balance? You know, again, yeah, is, that's is, a great question. Is that the only way to work? You know, just kind of all in to the point of hurting ourselves or or making ourselves sick. You know, I. I honestly think some of it is the person. So I take full responsibility for my part in this. The piece of it that I think is the reality of the culture is that, you know, if you're going to be the head person running something, especially a small nonprofit, there's going to be a lot of hours you need to commit in order to do the job well. Mm -hmm. And what I hear so many women say and what I've experienced is the feeling that, you know, I can't do the mommy well and I can't do my job well. And by well, our standard might be extremely high, Bridget. Mm, I think that's the thing, you Mm -hmm. know. There are people, no doubt, who are realistic and very cool about it and self-confident just say, listen, I can't be uber mommy and I can't be uber director, but I'm going to be the best I can be. They give themselves that grace, you know, they just let themselves do both more gently. You know, I wasn't like that. And I think it reflected in my body having challenges, being able to keep a pregnancy and keep myself as healthy as I needed to be. Um, So I think it's both things. I mean, I think we really still, as a culture and a country, don't value and appreciate 
the important role that a parent plays being there for their child. So it's not as though the workplace alone needs to adjust. Mm. There need to be adjustments to make child care easier. Mm. I mean, even quite honestly, the 40-hour work week. Right. I mean, that was a decision. That, right? <laughs> you know, it's always been interesting to me that there's almost a kind of weird sadistic or masochistic pride, I think, that some people take in being like, oh, well, I work way more than 40 hours. You know, that's mm-hmm. the bare minimum. Um, you know, and what is that? You know, why why do we have that kind of culture? Did you see that in the nonprofit world? You know, there it, there have been studies that show there's kind of hero hours, and there's yes. also a lot of burnout. Uh, yes. Very mission driven yes. work, and that's what part of what you were doing as well. Did you feel that you were sort of on the verge of burnout? Did you see that around you? Oh, I I absolutely saw that. And yes, that was really a lot of the reason I left. I mean, I left a job I loved. I left my dream job. And, you know, you don't do that lightly. It was the result of a lot of soul searching on my part where I realized I am physically, mentally, emotionally completely burned out. And I have got to, if I'm serious about having a child, I have got to get myself in a place where I can do work, good work, but I don't feel the same level of stress. And, you know, your point about nonprofit, public interest work being particularly prone to that sort of hero um, factor, it's so part of that psychology. I mean, it's really true. And it's not just an egotistical thing. I mean, it's a true feeling that many times when you're doing that work, but for you and your intervention and you being there, something very bad might happen. Hmm. And that's not an exaggeration. I mean, it's for real. You know, very often there's so few hands on deck to do that good work. It does lead to this sense of, you know, I don't like having to be here this much, but I really need to be. So what's it like now? You've uh, you've changed jobs. You've ratcheted back the stress, so to speak, and the responsibilities. Uh, How would you describe the way you make time for work and life now? I feel a little bit like a recovering alcoholic, um, you know, where I am careful not to go to the bar. You know, (laughs) I have to watch myself a lot. I mean, really, quite seriously, I think there is a little bit of an addiction to work that had happened for me. And I don't feel like I have that right now, but I have to say I keep a watchful eye on myself and I am prone to lapse still into a frenetic workplace. But what grounds me and brings me back is this little eight-year-old boy who (laughs) does need me to be at home. That's Kenneth Howitt. I spoke with her from her office in Atlanta, where she is Director of Sustainability Initiatives at Emory University, and a mom. So, Dan, what do you think? Uh, I think one of the things we heard was the seduction of work comes from the idea that you understand that when you do this work, this is what happens. When I write this proposal, maybe we get the client or we get funded, right? When I write this report for the world, X number of people see it and they read it and they appreciate the ideas. I think often in the rest of our lives, the input output isn't so clear. You know, I made time to just relax and read a book. Great. But, you know, what does that mean? Workers who are also parents often have the kind of clearest demands on their time from other aspects of their life. And while those clear demands can create stress and conflict when they're in tension with the clear demands of work, at least having them kind of gives people a reason to step away. And so her son, it sounds like, helps her understand that there are other parts of life that are also, you know, you need to invest time in. And and they're kind of very clear asks. And is there a way to work that does sort of uh, honor that sense of calling, but also doesn't burn you out? I hope so. <laughs> um, and we're hoping to find it. I think it's it is a trap to say that any individual person needs to structure work that way. I think there are kind of far greater societal, cultural, and organizational forces within workplaces that put these demands on people. And to say, well, you've chosen one way or the other, and that's your problem, I think often is tricky. So our work is saying, okay, maybe there are some things that individuals can do. But also we recognize that the ability of any one person to change the face of work-life conflict is limited. And it's really about changing how organizations function 
to stop forcing people to make those choices. All right. Great. Dan, thank you so much for coming by and talking with us. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Dan Connolly. He's a senior associate at Ideas42, the behavioral science and design lab we've teamed up with to look at the art and science of living a full life. You can find out more about their work at ideas42.org. For more resources on working healthier, visit us online at newamerica.org. Click on the link for Better Life Lab. Better Life Lab is produced by New America in partnership with Slate. Thanks so much for joining me for our podcast about the art and science of living a full and healthy life. It's a collaboration with Ideas42, supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Our producer is David Schulman. If you enjoyed this episode, take a moment to review us on Apple Podcasts. And for more stories and research about working healthier and more effectively, visit us online at newamerica.org. I'm Bridget Schulte.